Welcome to this next episode of Banking on Air, Vacuum Labs podcast. I'm Helene Panzerino and I'm your host. And we are continuing our series on all things to do with Bitcoin blockchain. And today it's decentralized finance and NFTs. And for this series, as usual, I am not alone. I'm joined once again by David Stansel. David, welcome back. And for those of who missed, who somehow missed episodes one and two of our series, should we give them a little bit of a background on you? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here again. Yeah, as I mentioned already before, I've been researching cryptocurrencies for quite some time now. I've been advising to a lot of companies and startups and projects that have been working in the cryptocurrency area. And I've been also teaching at the university this beautiful subject of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. And in my free time, I also write, uh, work on a book that is concerned with the history and the evolution of cryptocurrencies as well. Oh, I feel your pain there, David. The, the book writing thing, as you know, a couple of them in there. Listen, so I said, thank you for joining us. Obviously, I said from the beginning of this that we're carrying on with our theme. And this time we're getting into something where, okay, DeFi, right? Decentralized finance and NFTs, which we kind of alluded to a little bit in episode one. And I thought might be a fad. So as we dig into this deeper, we can talk more about what this is and why is it still with us and will it stay? So last time we spoke a lot about Ethereum, how it was different from blockchain. And we're getting into a lot of the unstructuring of these discussions and descriptions and definitions. So decentralized finance. What is decentralized finance? Yeah, I think decentralized finance uh, is one of the most exciting uh, you know, use cases of, of the whole blockchain world. As the name suggests, it is a parallel financial universe that consists of a decentralized smart contract-based applications mm. that uh, perform functionalities that we are usually accustomed to see in uh, financial institutions, banks, exchanges, uh, hedge funds, and so on. But these functionalities are performed in DeFi by these pieces of code that are uploaded on some of the blockchain networks, such as Ethereum. And because they are uploaded there in a distributed network, they are basically unstoppable oftentimes. They are impossible to tamper with. And they are, you know, fully automated. And together they create a beautiful, very exciting universe of uh, applications and actually also products that we haven't had here before. Wow. And again, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, and for those of you who missed the, the previous episode, go back on there and have a listen to what we talked about, smart contracts being probably misnamed. And I think you mentioned that Vitaly actually said that probably was a, a poor name for what they are because you just said again, their applications, right? I did not realize though that we were going into a parallel universe. I have to be completely honest. Okay. <laughs> so this is good. This is good. Now you mentioned that there are products and their services and that 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 it's it's happening in parallel to what we'd normally be doing in financial services. So what's some a couple of examples of products and services and which are the most popular that would take be part of this other world? Because as every you know, financial system, at the beginning, we need to create a lot of kind of financial primitives that are the core uh, of the whole system and upon which other applications can be built. And therefore, the, some of the first use cases we could see in this area of DeFi uh, were always uh, some exchanges. These exchanges usually function a little bit differently to the regular exchanges that most of the traders are used to, so-called you know, order book-based uh, exchanges. What was one of the greatest innovations so far in DeFi was the invention of the concept of uh, AMMs, Automated Market Makers, which uh, were probably one of the first exchanges of this kind was Uniswap, which is uh, now kind of a multi-billion project that was initially founded by a single guy with a grant of $60,000. And uh, 
this was probably like three years ago and now it's you know now this decentralized exchange has volumes of um, like 10 billion a month or something and it's probably the major trading venue for everybody in DeFi. and maybe to clarify how is this different and what kind of advantages it offers to traders is that in a typical order book based exchanges you always need to have you know two parties someone who wants to sell somebody who wants to buy whereas in the AMMs all this is basically performed by the smart contract so you don't need to find the second party that uh, you trade with but this smart contract always gives you a quote on the on the trade you want to make so the main point is that it makes all, all kind of assets uh, much more liquid than it would usually be and uh, that's uh, why you know it was kind of easy to bootstrap in the DeFi space because there were so many tokens and they had very little liquidity and through these automated smart contracts they became more liquid and more easily tradable and of course that was uh, very desirable from that uh, from the perspective of the teams developing these applications so decentralized exchanges is definitely the first product to move forward uh, some of the other very important product and protocols in the space include the uh, lending protocols these are protocols that basically allow you to borrow some assets we are still talking about crypto so there are no fiat money involved it's always about the crypto assets different kinds of crypto assets some of them might be you know, stable coins but uh, some other assets of course include you know, stuff like ethereum uh, all kinds of DeFi tokens which we can explore later on so these are the protocols where again we don't necessarily have the you know the counterparty during the lending but we have a smart contract that performs this a smart contract that can you know hold on to a collateral and uh, and against this smart contract people can borrow and lend uh, assets so these are one of the most popular applications in defi so far and uh, then then we have a bunch of others like uh, different derivatives platforms that allow us to create some synthetic assets recently there was a lot of hype about these protocols because basically they allow some people like profit traders let's say at this point to trade really like uh, stocks but on the blockchain which are synthetic stocks so they are not you know <laughs> legacy regulated stocks that we know from the um, legacy financial world but these are just tokens that um, are synthetically created and their value is pegged to the their real world counterparts to the stocks of those companies but the difference is of course that because they are in the blockchain world there are different rules apply you know you might not need to be you know kyc it and you not provide your identity and stuff like that and uh, you know there might not be some limitations or restrictions that are in place in their regular trading venues. David, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, okay, I get it. I can listen to you how this all runs in a parallel world. Also, derivatives in the real world are complicated enough, but taking them somewhere else is interesting. For me, as the kind of woman on the street type thing, you know, the the person that's not into the technology side of it, why would I do this? Why would I get involved in this? instead of doing it in the other world, in the traditional financial world? Well, uh, why would you do it? So the truth is that probably something like 1.5 billion people in the world don't have access even to the bank account, not to mention the you know access to the capital markets and the financial markets in general. So, of course, all these DeFi systems and, and protocols are all permissionless. So that's definitely one of the greatest advantage that could be accessed by anyone. Of course, in reality, they are still more kind of a you know play for speculators and traders that can afford uh, to also lose lots of money uh, as we also also mentioned in the previous episode uh, also the ethereum network has been congested a lot and the transaction fees skyrocketed and the height of these fees made it kind of unfeasible for any non-bank people to interact with these protocols as of now but of course the scalability is a big topic in the crypto space and there are many many efforts and initiatives to solve these problems and we can expect i think quite reasonably that in a matter of uh, one two years uh, i think it can be again uh, much more accessible to many people that are non-banked as well so for now it's made mostly for speculators and hopefully in the future we will see more common people interact with these protocols as well
Yeah, it's good to hear that because I kind of, you know, when I think back to, well, I think how all this started, it was about democratizing and taking away the real sense of authority and not being bound by specific regulations, but making them yourselves. So all a consensus and agreement. And so it kind of flies a little bit in the face of having to exclude people if we can't, we can't do that. So it's, we'll keep an eye on how, where that's going. And another question in, in the <laughs> terrestrial financial world, let's call it, especially around lending, for example, we have a lot of aggregated platforms where you know the information is together, you can access things. Does that exist in the DeFi world as well? Oh, yeah, we do know what are called like uh, DeFi aggregators or perhaps uh, kind of DeFi UI user interface aggregators, because now we have really like a whole like a spectrum of protocols. And for people like the, for the power users who have been using all of them, it's quite hard to keep track of all of them. So what is now being created and becoming increasingly more popular are these kind of integrator, are aggregators slash integrators where uh, on one single page, basically you can, uh, you just log in with your Ethereum address, which we also mentioned uh, like last time that it's kind of a single sign on for the crypto world. And these applications or these aggregators, you know, read your uh, transaction history and they can tell you, you know which protocols you interacted with where are your assets uh, maybe what kind of yield is on those assets as of now because this is something that is dynamically changing in the in the DeFi space which is very interesting and of course uh, this is very important to mention is that uh, one of the incentives and uh, one of the reasons why people play around with these protocols is that yields in these protocols are much higher than you know in a you know, legacy applications, even on an unstable coin. So having a dollar in the bank account and having a dollar on blockchain can be really, really different experience, uh, not only because of different UI experiences, but mainly because that in the DeFi world, you can get like easily like 10, 12% per annum on your dollars, uh, kind of very low, low risk, almost a risk-free way. <laughs> Wow. And I can see why people would then want to get involved as well if we continue to stay the way we are in a traditional environment where there's interest rates are near zero in most of the world. Um, it's not very attractive, is it? You mentioned the blockchain and in this context. And, and is there a blockchain that's the main DeFi venue? Yeah, I think we mentioned it also last time that uh, for now it's still Ethereum, even though there are a lot of competitors, you know, entering the space and trying to compete with Ethereum. But uh, even though most of them actually are trying to more kind of complement Ethereum and be sort of an extension of Ethereum itself. Uh, so that's why most of them kind of copy the Ethereum virtual machine so all the smart contracts on top of Ethereum are easy to deploy on these other blockchains. And that's why also we see that there are lots of so-called bridges being built where um, you can transfer easily assets from Ethereum to these other blockchains such as uh, Cardano, Solana, Near, Avalanche, and so on and so on. So you can transfer assets between these blockchains in an easy and ideally trustless way. Mm, okay, so that makes sense as well. As it gets more congested, you need other other ways to be able to, literally, I suppose, move it around. You spoke about the fact that this, you know, a lot of this is industry people that have been in, in it and they're in it intensely, and that it hasn't yet rolled out to let's call it the general public, because partly to do with fees, partly to do with the the technologies and and other things. But one thing that has captured the imagination, I think, of the general public, is NFTs, <laughs> and there's there's people sitting on either side of the debate here, aren't there? People are saying, what is this? You know, is this real? Can I, is it virtual art? Is it real art? What's the deal in the token there? What's fungible mean, for example, when it says non-fungible token? Is it something that's going to stick around? Is it something that's a fad? You know, I was listening to someone last week say, well, maybe we should get involved in this. And someone else saying, well, no, we're getting involved in this. It's not going to be around for much longer. It's just something that's a fad. So let's roll it back again, as we have been doing. What is an NFT? Because it is capturing the imagination. Yeah, NFTs are basically tokens like any others, but unlike the regular tokens, which are kind of inter interchangeable because they have the same qualities, same properties, and that's why we call them fungible. Non-fungible tokens are unique in some ways. So they usually have a kind of unique set of traits or 
yeah, they are basically unique and each of the NFT tokens it has some unique properties. The first wave uh, on the hype of NFTs was like in end of 2017 with CryptoKitties, which caused lots of hysteria on the market. And basically at some point, uh, these single applications almost paralyzed the whole Ethereum network at that point of time. Then uh, during 2018, 2019, it was uh, kind of uh, the whole market was dead for a long time. And now we could see in the last few months, again, kind of resurrection of the NFTs, which became very popular, especially among the artists that found a way in NFTs to monetize their art and digital art usually, even though there are some cases where it was uh, dealt with us with physical art. So long story short, NFTs uh, can represent uh, multiple kinds of assets. Typically, they are used for art, as mentioned, but probably kind of more (laughs) meaningful use case for those. For NFTs will be like game assets from different virtual worlds because uh, lots of gamers deal with this problem that they invest lots of time and resources in uh, building their characters in, in some particular games and they collect lots of uh, virtual items. But once they decide to leave that uh, particle ecosystem, it's not liquid. They don't have much to do with their assets. And uh, NFTs and the common you know, standard for the NFT trading, uh, Ethereum blockchain, allows all these assets to become more liquid. And that's, of course, very desirable for many people. So I suppose in a way, you know, I remember, I remember for well, many years back now, probably around 2012, 2013, there were people that were trying to help the gamers to monetize without having just the publishers make all the money before they actually were able to monetize themselves. So this has been a, a problem that's existed in that space and that, in the, that group of professionals for quite a while. And I get, and as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of thinking, are there parallels in what happened with music as well? You know, in terms of artists who were losing their rights or people were copying it and they were finding different finding ways to actually make sure that they got compensated when it went out onto like streaming platforms and things like that as well. I'm kind of stretching thinking, will I see the Mona Lisa one day tokenized in an NFT? But, you know, but as you said, it's mostly mostly digital art with a, with a little bit of, of other that we've seen it in the public eye, capturing the public eye. But it, there's a more serious side behind it for the gaming industry as well. What do you think? Is this something that's going to stick around or is this something that, I don't want to call it a fad, but is it a phase and will something replace it? I think what we could see in the past months, it was definitely lots of hype with unreasonable expectations and uh, some of the uh, events that happened. Uh, I think there are lots of price level in the whole NFT market was unreasonably high, in my opinion. On the other hand, I do believe there will be lots of meaningful meaningful applications there because uh, the whole world is getting digitalized and there will be just more and more digital assets whatever it means it can be you know like your university diploma will be a digital asset for the future and uh, this is probably one way where we will see also application of nfts in the future some universities already experiment with that we will see if they will eventually call it nfts or not or if it will be just a digital certificate whatever but uh, we will definitely see these kind of use cases uh, more and they will sustain for example one of the very interesting applications in my opinion are that there are some of the vr worlds which uh, offer basically they tokenize the land in their virtual world And again, this land has a form of NFT tokens. And again, this is quite the lively market that has been going on for the last almost two years, let's say, even though it was mostly under rather from the mainstream media, but it's there, it's growing. And uh, it's one of the, in my opinion, very convenient and appropriate use cases for it. Maybe to back to your questions, if we will see Mona Lisa being tokenized once, we definitely can tokenize physical assets as well but it comes with different trade-offs and uh, different risks because always if you want to tokenize something physical you need to reliably connect it to the blockchain and it's kind of an issue Um, we can do it but there is still some trust needed for it and um, that's why i think it's kind of more complicated and NFTs make sense mostly in the realm of digital world. And that makes sense as well, because if you think about, as you said, how much digital data we have 
And then you hear these kind of horror stories where people potentially pass away or something like that. Or they, and no one knows where all these digital assets are because they haven't shared keys or they haven't shared in, access to them in any other kind of way. And I guess as we move more that way, we need to find ways for us in our daily lives to be able to use that. You mentioned the whole university side of things. You know, when I think about it, I've had to get copies. I have a physical copy of one of my degree certificates in a frame. And every time I go to do something, I have to put it on a photocopier to actually do something with it. It's crazy in this day and age, right? But if, if something happened to that, hopefully, with the, you know, the, the store that they have on them, I, I can go back for birth certificates. I mean, there's lots of things that I could imagine from a practical point of view, that doesn't mean that there's shared ownership in any of this. Clearly, that's just more like a the storage and access side of things. And I think that's interesting that it's digital world as opposed to a physical world. And I think I feel a bit less cynical about it now, having had this conversation with you. And maybe to some of our listeners and some of our subscribers, they might feel the same thing and we might stay more in tune. Also, it's been really great to go through the DeFi because every time I hear it and everyone's talking about decentralized finance, I think I don't really understand what this is. We all want to know what these terms mean. And and our whole journey from blockchain to Ethereum to DeFi to NFTs came about because we realized that sometimes when you're in the bubble, you don't look outside and see how other people perceive it. And, you know, we want to at Vacuum, we want to share all as much information with our subscribers as possible. So I've enjoyed the series. Thank you, David, for educating us along the way. It's been super enjoyable. We're not in one of your university classes, but we've learned in, on the job, as it were. And I hope that we'll be picking up again and seeing where everything goes as this space evolves. Everybody, those of you who are subscribers, thank you very much. If you're not, if you're listening for the first time, go back and listen to the first two episodes and subscribe through all the usual channels. This has been Banking on Air. <laughs>